So when I started practicing as an architect, a few years uh, into my practice after my graduation, um, I began to realize that most people in my country do not have access to the services of an architect. Um, that's because a large part of India lives in rural areas and um, even in the big Indian cities, most of the housing is being built um, by the people themselves. That's because there's an acute shortage of affordable housing because of inadequate planning measures. And so people end up building their own uh, solution, their own self-built neighborhoods, which are referred to as informal settlements, uh, commonly also called slums, uh, though we try to refrain uh, from using that word. And um, I began to realize, um, uh, I mean, I began to question really, what is the role um, of an architect? What is the relevance of my profession? Unless I'm able to engage with the socioeconomic and political reality of the built environment I'm living in. And um, that is when I decided that I needed to learn um, to work outside the formal frameworks of planning and architecture. And so that's what I've been trying to do over the last few years. And I think there's a long way to go. So the first initiative I wanted to um, show you is something called Missing Basti. Now, Basti is a Hindi word for a self-built settlement. And uh, it started as a student workshop in 2017. So these uh, informal settlements uh, that I was talking about, a large part of them are also considered illegal by the government, by the planning authorities, because they fall outside the purview of uh, planning measures. And so we realized that um, there are so many forced evictions of these neighborhoods which take place in our city, which go undocumented, which are not talked about. It was very important for us to um, start uh, archiving them. And that's also when I learned that an, arch an architect need not always build. An architect can also be an activist. An architect can also be an archivist. And we can use our skills in so many different ways. And so here, um, this sketch is uh, by one of my students from SEPT University, where she has depicted the process of eviction from morning to evening and what it looks like to bring out the, um, to bring out the sort of reality on ground because a large part of uh, Delhi doesn't know about it. And uh, this snowballed into a larger sort of a movement over the next two, three years, as more people started joining hands with us. And these are academics, social workers, human rights lawyers, activists. Um, and uh, everyone had been thinking about the same thing for a few years, and uh, we all uh, managed to come together uh, because we all work in the housing rights sector you know, one way or another and decided to archive all the forced evictions that have taken place in Delhi over the last 30 years. And thanks to the data um, shared by researchers such as uh, Gautam Bhan and Veronique uh, Dupont, and also organizations such as Human Rights and Law Network, uh, we were able to create this negative print of a city, uh, if you will, um, where um, we realized that uh, 300 evictions had taken place in the last 30 years in Delhi, and most of them had gone um, undocumented. Um, it was very important to create this uh, presence of an absence um, if we are to begin to de erase this loss. Unless we are able to um, talk about what has gone missing, we can't really uh, start to build a better sort of uh, a future, a better sort of uh, idea of what an inclusive city can look like. And since then, I think this data has been really useful for a lot of researchers, uh, students, and uh, policymakers to start building further on this. And it brings me to one of the first projects that um, I would call it a process rather, um, that started the practice. So Social Design Collaborative um, started because of uh, you know, this, this, this process I'm going to describe. And this starts here um, on the floodplains of the Yamuna. So the river which passes through Delhi is the Yamuna. And um, this part is called Yamuna Thada, which stands for Yamuna's floodplains. And, uh, a little known fact about Delhi is that there is farming which takes place in the heart of the city. Delhi is one of the very few cities in the world to still have urban farming. Uh, but because of uh, issues of class and caste, because uh, farmers are looked at as marginalized uh, people, um, most of the city doesn't know about it and they've been facing evictions uh, for some time now. I do want to add that in the past, after our independence, there was a system for many decades when the planning authorities were giving out leases to the farmers and they were farming uh, legitimately. But over time, as the planning authorities' imagination of the city changed, uh, because they decided they want to build um, parks and jogging tracks and cycling tracks there. Uh, the farmers started facing evictions because it is public land and they started being seen as encroachers. So moving on to uh, what happened in that particular locality is that a school was demolished. 
And the people in that community approached me to help them rebuild the school because they had gone to the court and fought the case um, in the court and gotten permission to rebuild it. And they knew that I, you know, I did some design work in the, in the social sphere. And I'm not going to go into the details of the design, just to quickly say that you know, over a few discussions, over a few months, we were able to create a design which worked uh, for, the, for the administration of the school, for the parents, for the children. And we realized that uh, the best way to make a temporary school, because the permission was to build a temporary school, which can be interpreted in many ways. You can use temporary materials. Um, the approach that we took was to build a dismantleable school, a school that can be dismantled in case there's an eviction. And we also decided to use uh, light materials for infill, such as walls, doors, and windows. But the frame itself is built in metal, um, MS sections, which are bolted and can be quickly unbolted. So that was a sort of uh, solution that we all came up with. And over time, as we started talking uh, about it, because um, the school was trying to fundraise, um, more and more people started joining um, hands. And again, this was surprising because it snowballed into, again, a larger movement as people came to also help us build the school. And um, in the summer of 2017, when Delhi is really hot, in three weeks, we ended up building the school with our own hands. After a year, um, after the school uh, ran there for a year, we had to relocate the school because of land ownership issues. And again, I'm not going to go into details uh, because of lack of time, but uh, the school authorities uh, tried their best to find an alternate piece of land in that area, which wasn't possible. So they decided to then donate the school to another uh, civil society organization who could create that sort of a space for our children elsewhere. And an NGO called the Child Trust stepped in and they transported the school further south of the, of, uh, the river. And that's where the school um, stands today. You can see the dismantling and the rebuilding process. It did not happen simultaneously. It was dismantled and the school was stored for a few months uh, before it was rebuilt in 2019. And so in the new locality, we used uh, a few different materials, few of the same materials like bamboo reused wood, but also we decided to use the traditional uh, weave called charpai, which stands for uh, you know, traditional cot, which is very common in that area. And I think that's, uh, that's also why the school has taken on a very unique sort of a look, which people really appreciate. There's a lot of pride and ownership um, in seeing the same materials that they use to build their houses, uh, to see the same materials uh, be used uh, in the construction of this school. And this is how it looks today. I think you might have seen the pictures. The, the approach, the design approach to the school also sits very well with the, with the pedagogy of the child trust, where they focus a lot on outdoor learning, on sustainable living, and I'm really happy to say that the school is now open again after two years of you know, three waves of the pandemic. It has been um, you know, working as a very important support system for not just the children, but also the entire community. But very quickly, we also began to realize that uh, the school uh, is a solution. Um, it's really a band-aid solution because the school has been demolished. So we help them rebuild the school. But what is the root of the problem is also something that we need to think about. Why are farmers being evicted in the first place? And so that's when we also need to step out of you know, the role of an architect and a designer and maybe start thinking at a policy level, at a planning level. So our work since 2019 has involved talking with planning authorities and advocating for the rights of the farmers and more importantly, uh, questioning the riverfront development plan. Do we need parks and jogging tracks, cycling tracks? Can, can we not have farms with uh, you know, parks? Do we have to remove one piece of green to create another piece of green? So this has involved a lot of community consultations and uh, uh, consultations with the Delhi Development Authority. You can see the loss of farmland from 2000 to 2020 on satellite imagery, we were uh, able to map that. So from covering half of the floodplains, uh, they cover only half, uh, one third of the floodplains today. Um, we formed a collective, uh, we joined a collective, sorry, called Mebi Delhi, which stands for I Am Delhi 2, which is made up of uh, some 40 civil society organizations who have been uh, working um, to advocate a more inclusive uh, plan for Delhi because the latest master plan for Delhi has just come out uh, this year. The plan is for 2041. So a plan comes out every 20 years. And we've been working for the last two years to advocate for more participation in the plan, especially for the farmers along the river. And so it, you know, a set of demands has been shared. Um, and alternative imaginations of what this riverfront could look like 
is something that we have tried to share with the, with the authorities. And I'm happy to say that um, as a result, for the first time, this master plan, this is a Ford master plan in Delhi, this master plan acknowledges the presence of farmers and also says that uh, farming may be allowed on the floodplains. It's a permissible activity. So it's a, it's a small win for us because the evictions, meanwhile, continue because uh, there are so many you know, different uh, levels of engagement which are required. While the master plan, in principle, says it's OK, the Riverfront Development Plan you know, continues to evict people. So we realize that um, this requires a very diverse approach. Um, so there is policy, there's planning, there's activism, there's also public engagement. There's also changing of the perception of uh, the residents of Delhi, of, of how they see the farmers. And so this has involved a lot of mapping uh, exercises as well, uh, because the farmers are not on any official list. They are not on any official maps which have been made by the planning authorities. So what can maps made by the farmers look like? What can this sort of alternative vision look like has involved a lot of um, um, well advocacy and engagement with the farmers there. And also collective artistic, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, initiatives. So just this week, uh, we have organized an event called Chalo Yamuna, which means, you know, let's go to the Yamuna, where we are uh, inviting people of Delhi to come to the uh, riverfront themselves and, uh, you know, rethink for themselves what kind of a riverfront they would like, because most people haven't really been to the riverfront. The river, uh, you, you, you must know, is considered a drain in Delhi. It's, it's really polluted. And there is no connection that the residents of Delhi have with the river. And so it's also, unless you're there, unless you're on ground, uh, you can't really uh, decide what kind of a city, what kind of a riverfront you would like, and everything is left uh, to the planning authorities. So how can we try to open up that discourse a bit is what we have been working on. This is a map which has traveled from you know, house to house where the farmers have added their own sort of uh, house to it, their own farm to it. And uh, this is what they have been sharing with the people who have been coming for the walks. Um, I'm conscious of time, Swati. I know you're trying to deliver a lot of information in a very yeah, short I time. I speak very fast. So I'm going to then just go on to my uh, last slide. Um, this is a map that we're going to release tomorrow in an online launch where we're inviting the planning authorities. It's a nine month exercise we took with the farmers where 56 uh, busty, 56 uh, farming clusters on the floodplains have been meticulously mapped by the farmers themselves. And this is what we hope to launch tomorrow. Uh, evening, if anyone's interested in joining. And uh, finally, just to say that I think design has uh, yeah, different diverse uh, roles to play. And I'm not going to get into this slide, but we hope to continue building more such spaces, more schools, more daycare centers, while also working at um, uh, policy and um, uh, planning advocacy level. Thank you for listening. And I'm sorry if I, that was really fast for you.